Hey everyone, my name is Brady Witten, and this is The Word Meets the World for March 2nd, 2022. So the news has been full of the story of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and the Ukrainian people's response and really the international community's response. And the topic of war uh, is really what the news is all about these days. And this is a topic that we covered back on September the 29th, 2021, when the U.S. began their withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I'm gonna uh, invite you to, to revisit that episode of The Word Meets the World, and we're gonna continue this conversation next week. But what does the Bible say about war? That's our topic for this week's The Word Meets the World. So what does the Bible have to say about war? This is another subject where the Bible is not as clear as we might hope. In some places in Scripture, war is clearly shown as just a part of life. The writer of Ecclesiastes famously says, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest what is planted, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. In other passages, God, God's self, seems to be the one initiating and encouraging war. When the Israelites enter the land of Canaan, for example, they're commanded to go to war with its inhabitants. Uh, in Joshua 8, 1 and 2, we read this. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear or be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and go up now to Ai, See, I have handed over to you the king of Ai with his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its kings as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you may take as booty for yourselves. Set an ambush against the city and take it. Uh, there are even places in the Bible where the writers say plainly that God is not just a passive observer or war, but that God, God's self, is a participant in fighting for Israel. So in Exodus 14, uh, when the Israelites are fleeing captivity in Egypt, uh, we read this. Moses says to the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to keep still. Uh, and shortly after this, the Egyptian army is drowned in the Red Sea. So let's pause here and talk about the Bible in general for a moment. So the Bible is not just one book, but many books written over a period of some 1,500 years. And while it tells the story of the people of Israel, it is not primarily a history book as we understand history. Uh, the Bible is a theological book whose purpose is to reveal truths about God. It's meant to tell us who God is, what God is like, and what's the interaction between people and God like. So for many modern readers, the images of a warrior-like God uh, are difficult to embrace. I struggle with them myself. Uh, many of us, like me, have lived in times of relative peace and have never been in a battle. Uh, many of us, myself included, have never been enslaved or lived under oppressive foreign rule, but that was not the case for ancient Israel. Israel, in many ways, was the punching bag of the ancient world's great empires. Uh, in the Bible alone, they are enslaved by Egypt, they're conquered by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, then by the Persians, then by the Greeks. Uh, when we get to the New Testament, they're being oppressed by the Romans. And as a small nation with little power, Israel had little chance against these mighty empires. Uh, so from these experiences, an understanding of God emerged, actually that I have found uh, quite compelling. And the, and the image is this, God is on the side of the underdog. God cares about injustice. God stands up to the mighty, and God is the champion of the oppressed. And so when we read these images of God taking up for Israel, uh, we're not reading the story of a God who's like the neighborhood bully punching people in the nose and taking their lunch money. The God of the Bible is a God who fights for the enslaved, who fights for the poor, who fights for the oppressed, fights for the down and out. And again, I got to tell you, I find that image of God very compelling. 
And that's what the scriptures are trying to communicate with these warlike images of God. So at the same time as these warlike images of God, another vision emerges from Israel's wrestling. And uh, this vision comes primarily from the prophets. And it's a vision of a time where there would be war no more. Uh, so the prophet Micah, uh, in the fourth chapter, writes this. God will judge between many people and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. Uh, so for Christians, the way that Jesus lived his life both affirmed and foreshadowed this way of peace that the prophets talked about. He taught us to pray for our enemies and to turn the other cheek. And despite what many expected from the Jewish Messiah, he did not fight flesh and blood enemies with sword and spear, but conquered the greatest of all enemies with sacrificial love. Uh, the New Testament further affirms the prophet's vision of a time of no more war. The Apostle Paul calls God the God of peace and encourages Christians to live in peace with each other and with the whole world. And the book of Revelation, which is the very last book in the New Testament, the last book in the Christian Bible, depicts uh, what's known as the last battle at a place called Armageddon. And i got to tell you, this image, too, is one that has really started to capture my imagination. Uh, the idea that there will be a last battle. And the point is not how, how big the battle is or how many people engage in the battle or, or how bloody the battle is or how violent. The point is, it is the last battle and is a fulfillment of this prophetic vision that a time would come where there would be war no more. So what does the Bible say about war? Again, uh, we probably all wish it was a whole lot clearer. There are places where the Bible presents war as a tool of God, and there are places where the Bible envisions God's long-term plan as a time of eternal peace. So what are we to do with all this? So some Christians choose uh, passivism as their response to the scriptural witness. Uh, they believe that the way that God's kingdom comes is by us doing our part to enact God's perfect peace in the world today. Christian passivism affirms that any form of violence is incompatible with the Christian faith. Uh, and there are Christian sects like the Quakers, the Mennonites, and the Amish who hold to this view. Martin Luther King Jr. was a Christian pacifist and lived out this ideal through his practice of nonviolent resistance. So other Christians believe in what's called just war theory. Just war theory asserts that while war is not an ultimate part of God's plan, that because we live in a fallen world, sometimes war is necessary. Uh, John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist movement, of which I'm a part, uh, was a just war theorist. He believed there were times where war might need to be used as an instrument of national policy, especially in self-defense or to preserve the greater good. Think about it this way. Would it be loving and moral for someone to sit by and watch someone stronger hurt or kill someone weaker? Uh, would it have been moral for the U.S. to do nothing in the face of the evils of Nazi Germany, for example? When do we intercede? When do we do nothing? Uh, these are the questions of, of the just war theory. But from pacifists and just war theorists alike, one thing is clear. Christians cannot and should never celebrate war or violence. Although John Wesley was not a pacifist, he also said, people in general can never be considered reasonable creatures until they know not war anymore. So long as this monster stalks uncontrolled, where is reason? Where is virtue? Where is humanity? I also want to add that regardless of our views and, on war and warfare, the men and women who serve our country and literally put their lives on the line deserve nothing but our support and our respect. So what do you think? What do you think about all this? I want to leave you with a few discussion questions. And again, if you're with a group, uh, I would encourage you to talk about these questions and talk about this topic. Uh, if you're viewing by yourself, these are just things I invite you to think of on your own. I also, before we put those questions up, want to encourage you to like and share this video if you found it helpful. And like and subscribe and follow First Methodist on social media. See you next time, everyone.